and we're live. Guess what it is? It's three guys on the Mind State Marketing Hour with Will Leach. He's our favorite scientist. He's blinded us with science. And today we have an interview with Clayton Key, the power of being human in business. Boom. What a great intro. You did a great job, man. It's coming natural these days for you, Steve. <laughs> well, I'd, after a hundred shows, you'd think I might kind of get in into a rhythm. How many shows has it been, actually? Uh, I think it's, I don't know. I think it may be in the 70s or 80s, but I have big news. I, I, you just reminded me, big news, right? News. I didn't even tell you this. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had talked about being nominated for Marketing Research Podcast of the Year, and it's official that we are now in the finalists. I didn't know if you, I know you didn't know that. I just found that out yesterday in an email late in the afternoon. So Clayton, he's gonna bring us over the top in this podcast, it's all up to you. Yeah. If we don't win podcast of the year, we're gonna find yeah. out in a couple of weeks. But yeah, we're, we're down to three people, man. So congratulations, Steve, great job. You're the producer, you're the you're the glue. So thank you, we're top three, top three podcast. Yeah, but you're the sexy talent. And then you, yeah. then you, you got smart and you started calling <laughs> Yeah, you know, heavy hitters like Clayton in on these, right. and uh, you know what can I say? I just uh, I could see your your brilliance. Okay, <laughs> yeah. let well, me let me tell you. Yet, but but we'll let we'll let you guys know in about two weeks. I think I think the conference is in two or three weeks, so we'll let you guys know. <laughs> so what's the common theme here? What binds us three together? That you see the common theme, the black glasses. Okay, glasses. and we've all read this book. One of us even wrote it. It's the book with a new look. And if you're writing marketing messaging, if you're if you're strategizing on how to connect better to clients and you haven't read this book, then the chances are very high that your message is a one size fits all. And can you imagine if glasses came in a just a one prescription fits all? That would be frustrating. Would and be if nice. your message is not being ran through this book's filter, that's how it feels to your, your clients, your customers, your prospects, your employees. That's the truth. That's the truth. And it's all backed on behavioral science, everybody. So you speak to people's behavioral kind of science-based you know, tendencies they have in their mind. You speak to their psychology. You're going to get better research results. Um, so today we have a very special guest. Um, and it's a topic we haven't really talked about on the show a lot about, which is going to be Product design. Steve, that's a that's an area that I have a little bit of experience in, not as much as I wish I did. And um, when the opportunity came up to talk to Clayton Key, he is the vice president of business development at a great company called Shopa Health. More importantly, he has been using kind of behavioral sciences, behavioral psychology into product design, which is a question I get asked quite a bit. How do you do that? And so uh, I'm not real smart at that stuff. I have a couple of ideas, but I'm not great at that. But there is somebody who at least works in that space, and that is Clayton. So we're going to talk to Clayton today about not so much about marketing, though, Clayton, we may get in that topic anyways, because yeah. you know marketing as well. But um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the product design and using behavioral science to optimize the design of products today. So I'm looking forward to it. <clears throat> It's interesting. You know, I think that even though we would never admit, even under duress, that we have been in product design, I would argue that as a business owner, as a entrepreneur, as someone that's in charge of, of some aspect of a service or something with your company, you've done and dabbled in it and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And no. how nice, how nice would it have been to have a little insight from someone like Clayton? That's right. So Clayton, I'm going to have you introduce yourself a little bit more, but let me just give you the quick heads up on, on Clayton. Um, I've known Clayton for a little bit more, than, a little over a year now. He actually took uh, my course in behavioral marketing from Texas A&M's uh, Applied Behavioral Economics program, um, but he is now the vice president of product and business development at a company called Shopa Health, um, and he is going to tell us a little bit more about that. But basically what his passion is, is applying behavioral science to technology, particularly in the healthcare space, health outcomes. So he's got a really cool product uh, he's going to talk about. I'm hoping anyways, we've talked about it anyways, and where you are in that product that you got, you guys have been developing. Um, so he's got a, a BS in kinesiology, Bachelor of Science <laughs> from the University of Central Oklahoma. And he got his MBA. He's, he's a Texas guy. He's, he got his MBA from uh, UT, the uh, Macomb School of Business. And ultimately, you know, he's really passionate about health, 
wellness, fitness, and making the world a healthier, happier place. But one thing I love about what he's doing is he's bringing in science. I bring science into marketing. He's bringing science into product design. So uh, Clayton, welcome to the show. Really happy to have you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Will. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I was telling Steve before we get started, you know, it's a longtime listener, first time caller. So excited to be here. <laughs> There's a bunch of these people out there. Y'all got to y'all got to start texting when you're when you're watching and when you're listening, yeah. you got to text text in your thing. So, hey, let's just start off like not everybody knows who you are, Clayton. So let's just, you know, tell us a little bit about you. Like, where did you grow up? Where what kind of kid were you like? Um, and then how in the world did you end up in this world of yeah. merging behavioral science and health? Because it's a very unusual path. Yeah, so uh, I grew up not too far from where you are currently, Will, um, Dallas, Fort Worth area in a small town called Ulysses. Um, my parents were divorced at a pretty early age. So my mom and I actually moved in with my grandmother, who is wildly influential. Uh, she was 70 years old when I was born. And she is the five foot hundred pound woman that was outside mowing her lawn in the hundred degree temperature, climbing in trees to cut down branches, um, taught me how to swing a golf club as we would hit in her backyard. Um, so she was just this wildly influential person that really just taught me, you know, to be active, to put yourself out there, try new things. There's a lot of things she didn't know how to do, but it needed to get done. So she just found her way. Uh, and that's something that I've kind of always carried with me, um, always been an active kid. And that's what really brought me into sports, uh, picked up a, a strong knack for wrestling in high school, um, okay. was never the biggest kid and quickly realized, well, I just need to find a sport where everyone's the same size as we're competing. So, especially um, in Texas, yeah, especially yeah, in Texas. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, did, did the football thing and it was great. Went to Euless Trinity high school, which is a pretty dominant football program. Uh, but our offensive line is about 200 pounds heavier than me. And I quickly realized I'm just mm -hmm. not, not cut out for that. But yeah, pur pursued wrestling all through high school, was all state, competed on, a, on our national team, uh, and then actually carried that into college and wrestled collegiately at the University of Central Oklahoma. Um, and that's what really brought me into this entire passion about fitness. Uh, I actually thought I was going to be a, a professional athlete, go be a UFC fighter. A lot of my friends were doing that. Uh, and just kind of realized, you know, it, it's such a long journey. I was kind of burned out on being an athlete, wanted to, to try something different. Um, and yeah, just got, got into fitness, became a personal trainer, uh, really got passionate about helping people. And then somewhere along the way, I realized, you know, if I want to help as many people as I can, uh, I need to find a way to do it with technology. And then I needed to understand, well, how can I actually help people? How can I help people change their eating habits, their movement habits, get them into a, a more active uh, and healthy lifestyle? Persuasional wrestling. Yeah, wrestling, <laughs> you know, if you, if you have kids and you, you want great life lessons, put them in wrestling for a year or two. Um, it's just you out there on your own. You win on your own. You lose on your own. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of discipline, accountability, you know, great skill sets. So, you know, oh, hey, real quick, let me real quick, Steve. So, tell me about that journey of of when you decided to go get your MBA. That's a big difference between you. Know, you were maybe a trainer or whatever, and on one day you yeah. thought to yourself, "I need to go." Get, that's that's unusual. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, really, the the spark was I, I was a very successful trainer. I was making great money. I was pretty happy doing it. But you know, I, I just realized part of it was personal, the lifestyle I was living as a personal trainer, work a lot of hours. Um, perfectly fine as a young man in your early 20s. Uh, eventually, you know, that that becomes not so sustainable. Um, so I, I knew I wanted a little bit of a career shift. Uh, but the other piece is just exactly what I said. I, I quickly realized as a busy personal trainer, I can maybe impact 15 to 20 people tops. And I just saw kind of the direction things were going with health technology. Fitbit was starting to emerge. Uh, the Apple Watch had, had come out, and I'm just realizing all these people are being heavily influenced by technology. And I realized that there's probably an area I can fit into that sector. Um, but I, with just having most of my experience and education around fitness specifically, I knew I needed to enhance it uh, and break out on my own. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I knew University of Texas is by far the, the best business school kind of in the Southwest region. Uh, not a knock on anyone else, but, you know, uh, <laughs> they, have a, they have a terrific program. 
Um, and Austin's just a great city. And so I thought it'd be just a, a great experience to, to make a move from Dallas to Austin and pursue my MBA at UT. You know, when, when I finally start to see what I'm supposed to do, I realize I've been kind of messing around with it before, you know, and start, didn't realize I was kind of good at it until someone recognizes that. Did, did that happen with your product design journey? Yeah, I think that I I have always been somewhat of a builder. I like to build and find solutions. Um, you know, helping people is is something. Hard work and helping people came pretty natural. Uh, but gradually through my journey in life, um, even through college, I actually worked as a department manager at Home Depot and got heavy entrenched in uh, home improvement projects and building things in my hand, helping other people do the same thing. Um, and even in you know the, the personal training world. Uh, building out personal training programs and, and trying to do those sort of things. I've always been fascinated with um, kind of building things um, almost to the point of pursuing like an engineering degree, but just realized, you know, it, it wasn't for me. Uh, but yeah, I think there's just something fascinating um, both about trying to understand humans and what makes us make those decisions. And then how can we actually build things to help people? <laughs> um, look at this we've got some what are they called these uh bots what's this oh, oh, it's a bot it's a bot. <laughs> may, may school of business <laughs> yeah, I, should, I shouldn't have jumped out and said by far the best. it's a uh, university of texas is a very good business school there are other very good business schools in the area as well we have a large aggie following here clayton That's we have a large aggie, aggie following good to see you again lance Hey, so so you said something, and you transitioned into this idea of you were interested in in understanding how people make decisions, and, and that's I don't think every designer thinks that way, right? I think that designers know that it's important to account for human factors or whatever in the design of whatever it is they're designing, but you took it to a different step, level, a, a little bit of a different level. So, tell me that story if you remember of of when you were introduced to behavioral science or this idea of really understanding how people make decisions is the way you're going to go down the path of product and, and service design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it was really somewhat of a journey, right? So I graduated with my degree in exercise uh, science and um, very well educated in that field and thought, I'm just going to go out. I'm going to tell people what to do. They're going to do it. They're going to have these amazing outcomes. And it's just going to be awesome. Um, and so, you know, part of that did happen. Uh, I started doing some personal training, influencing people's fitness, getting stronger, getting a little bit healthier. And then I started realizing there's all these other aspects of health outside of it. So I went kind of down a rabbit hole of continuing education in about four or five different areas before I even found my way to behavioral science. And so I started thinking, okay, nutrition's a big factor. Let me learn everything I can um, and to, to be able to influence people's nutrition habits and educate them on, on what the right things to eat are. Um, and then it became about, well, stress and hormones and endocrinology is very important. So starting to understand uh, the role of cortisol and, um, you know, your, how your thyroid plays a role and your sex hormones and, and how those can heavily influence things and daily movement and just all these things that affect metabolism. And so I, I recognized a pattern of like, okay, I understand all the things people need to do to live a very healthy lifestyle. Uh, and then I would communicate these things with clients and I would just see, you know, every once in a blue moon, you get a, a rock star client who comes in and they just do exactly what you say. And they have these amazing transformations, but 99% of people, that's just not the case. So uh, I really wanted to understand, well, I know that these people, it's not like they're just not wanting to change. Like we have very, very, um, you know, empathetic conversations about how badly they want to change their lifestyle, how they want to be healthier, some of their strong motivations around being there to see their, ki their kids, their grandkids grow up, so on and so forth. Uh, and so I just realized there was a missing piece. So I started really reading a handful of books, mostly about habits, habit formation, habit change, um, Good Habits, Bad Habits by Wendy Wood, uh, Tiny Habits by DJ Fogg, a handful of those things realize that there's just this like missing link um, within the, the health world, whether it's personal training, uh, nutrition, dietitians, physical therapists, um, you know, even in the healthcare world, nurses, doctors, whatever it may be, where we are communicating what things for people to do, uh, but we're not really setting them up well to do it. And so 
that was kind of the aha moment of there's just this big gap. And ever since that, I've just gone, you know, as deep as I can down the rabbit hole um, and, and reading, trying to learn as much as I can about behavioral science, about uh, human decision making habits, whatever I can get my hands on that I can better understand how we make decisions um, in order to, to then create tools and solutions to be able to help uh, facilitate those changes. You know, I, I had a great personal trainer. And yep. one of the things he did, there's the shame that you carry about letting yourself go so bad, you know, and you show up the first time that you, you, you get your, you get your butt kicked, right? You're, you're st struggling to breathe and all this, and you're really hard on yourself about that. But he helped me uh, more than just get in better shape. He helped me overcome that hurdle of, of seeing myself getting better, not worrying about how I had let myself go. Yeah. yeah that's a, that was gonna say, that's a big deal. My mom has that issue too. She's been talking about getting health, but when she, we took her into a gym and she saw so many younger people and it just freaked her out. She never went again. And anyway, so it's, that's a big deal that the whole, the whole kind of esteem motivation things like that and overcoming that that's a big hurdle. I think, mm -hmm. I think in, in exercise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, you know, there, there's so many hurdles, you know, um, and, and personal trainers sometimes struggle with this. The average personal trainer is typically a young, very fit person who has always been athletic and always been fit and loves, you know, uh, exercise and extremely well educated about it. So they know what they're doing. Um, and it's sometimes hard for them to relate to what the, you know, other 99.9% .9 of people uh, in this world experience. And uh, so, you know, it, there's definitely a big gap between um, those connections and a, a big gap in the field where personal trainers just think, well, I do this every day. Why can't, you know, Steve do this? Why can't Will do this? Why can't, um, you know, everyone else just do this? Um, so, you know, it's, it's great that you've had that experience to, to, to have, you know, working with someone who understands that hurdle and helps you move past that beyond just the, the physical um, telling you what to do. Oh, man. Let's talk a little bit about um, what I want to get into is, uh, I, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Shapa Health. Is that, is that right? Shapa. 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 We, we get Shapa. a lot of Shapa, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shapa Health. Tell me about Shapa Health, what you guys are doing, and then specifically, you know, get, talk a little bit down, go down the path of, you know, you're deciding to at least bring in some elements of some of the things we're talking about into the design of, of, of the product. So tell us a little bit about the company, what you're doing there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Shapa, um, name originated from basically thinking like a Sherpa or a guide to get you in shape. So that's how the, the name came about. Uh, but what I really love about Shapa is it's one of the few um, solutions that's really designed to be a tool that influences your environment and is supposed to be a long-term intervention. It's not supposed to be something you do 10, 15, 20, 30 days to, to get ready for something, right? So the kind of flagship product behind Shapa, uh, co-founded by Dan Ariely, who's a very famous behavioral economist and one of our you know, more brilliant minds in the field. And there's a lot of really good things uh, about, you know, utilizing a, a scale daily um, and the, the real beneficial things of a, a basic bathroom scale, whether it's the, the fancy $200 one that gives you all sorts of feedback or, you know, the $10 one from the corner store is if you even just look at the scale without even stepping on it, a scale makes us think about our weight, which makes us think about our health, which then makes us think about the decisions that affect it. So, you know, think of it like a hang in there kitty sort of poster or some sort of daily motivation. It's really good to have a scale. A lot of people have poor relationships with scales, uh, but there's a lot of really good benefits. There's strong research. Um, individuals that step on their scale five or more days a week consistently have really good health outcomes in terms of weight loss um, through self-monitoring. So, you know, we, there's all these wonderful, beneficial things about a scale, but um, where Shapa kind of comes in is um, our other co-founder, our current CEO, Natty, uh, recognized that he was on his own personal health journey. Uh, his father had recently passed away of congestive heart failure, and he was just committed to being as healthy as he could be and working hard, doing a lot of the right things, um, weighing in daily. But what he realized is his hard work was not reflective in the day-to-day -day changes. So, you know, he goes out for an hour and a half bike ride. 
eats healthy all day on a Tuesday, steps on the scale Wednesday, and he might be a half pound heavier. And so what do you, yeah, what do you, what do you, and you know, we can logically know there's some day-to-day changes, but, but at, at the same time, you're working really hard and you see that, that that's a demoralizing experience. So what he quickly recognized is the day-to-day changes in body weight aren't necessarily reflective of the behaviors and the overall trend. Uh, so he partnered with Dan and um, worked to create our, our essential flagship uh, product is a numberless scale. We don't have a, a display on the scale at all and a mobile app, uh, the, the Shapa app. And the core feature is our five color feedback system. So as opposed to stepping on a scale, seeing 180.2 pounds and, and some random other statistics, we just give you one of five colors. And the five colors represent a trend of a few recent uh, measurements compared to about a three week data set. So all you're looking at is the trend over time and you're not necessarily seeing those day-to-day fluctuations that can motivate you. So our whole goal is we want you to get all the great experience and benefits of having a scale, of stepping on a scale, of thinking about your health for 10 to 15 seconds, and then thinking about the decisions you're gonna make that day to influence it. Uh, But we wanna remove all the negative stuff, right? So we wanna remove those uh, confusing, frustrating, demotivating uh, fluctuations. And we want to have something that you can do kind of on the, the long run. So that's kind of the, the flagship product. Um, as I said, five colors. We, we try and keep you going for the long term. Uh, we have green representing a um, just maintaining your, your weight. So that's the other kind of piece. Um, really focusing on reframing what many people would consider a plateau. Uh, teal and blue are a weight loss, light gray, dark gray, kind of a weight gain. So, you know, you don't really see those bad colors until you're really on that trend going upward for about a three to four week time period. So, yeah, that's uh, kind of shape in a nutshell. I always think it's interesting. You mentioned technology. You need to have technology and put in here. But what's happening is... First, you have to find a truth, and it's that concept. Don't measure yourself every day. That's a, it's a concept that you need to embrace a, a different paradigm, okay? Then you're using technology, and then you're implementing a strategy. And I think that's really powerful when you weave those three things together. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say the same thing, right, Steve? Like what, what, it, what I like about what you just did is you didn't start – with the technology, hey, we can create a scale that doesn't, you know, X or that can do X, Y, and Z. Instead, you're like, let's think about how people make decisions. It's actually, it's a very key point, I think, is my guess, in behavioral science-based product design, right? You're starting with the human, like yeah. Steve and I talk about, you're starting with the human at the front forefront of it versus, you know, the technology and marketing. We start off with our business. Like, here are the five things I want to tell you with my business. So let me just tell you, as opposed to That's- talking about first, thinking about how people make decisions and yeah. what emotionally connects with them. Yeah. 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 And on the, the kind of behavioral science part of it, um, you know, on the, on the product design, that's one of Dan's brilliant points is, you know, loss aversion. We talk about a lot in financial decisions and, and how things can influence, um, but it, it kind of works the, the same way in other variable uh, factors. So on the stepping on the scale piece, the, you know, frustration and bad feelings of, of gaining a pound are about twice as emotionally impactful as the positives of losing a pound. So, you know, it works kind of in that same way. So if you're, you know, if you're within a a two week time period, uh, you you really need to see twice as many positive outcomes to even counter any sort of a a negative. And that's one of the really important parts of our, our, you know, color feedback system is because so many people will see either a plateau or a small weight gain. And it's, just demoralizing enough for them to think, well, you know, I just need to stop doing all these behaviors that that are obviously not playing a role on my health. Um, when realistically, you know, it's just the the small physiological changes take time to to kind of set in. Yeah, it can be so deceiving to think that one one action is the cause of the weight gain, but the data showing you a true story. And right. that, that that's providing a way for people to move that big um, lie out of the way. Yeah, it's huge. 
So Clayton, let me ask you, you're a small business. I, uh, yeah, you don't have to tell me how big you are, but relatively I would consider small or medium sized business. Yeah, so tell wrestler. me a little bit about the, um, the hardest part about you're trying to do something that not a lot of companies are doing is my guess, right? You're probably in a very unique field because you're not trying to just become the next, you know, cool scale. You're trying to actually help people and society come, right. you know, come out of this with better outcomes. So tell me a little bit about what's the hardest problem to solve. First, do it from the product design side of things. Like you've been going, man, it's been so hard to integrate this idea, maybe from behavioral sciences into it. And maybe you've solved for that. And if you have solved for that, then tell me a little bit more about, okay, now, you know, how are we trying to get this company to the masses, right? There's, there could be shipping issues. There could be all sorts of things. And I don't want to go down too far down that path, but just being a small business owner, we talked to a lot of small business owners about yeah. all the hiccups in the business. So first, from the product design side, what's the hardest thing that you've had to overcome with the application of behavioral science? Yeah, so you know, product design is is very very difficult. Um, you know, it's one thing uh, in in marketing or sales to convince people one time of making a purchasing decision. Um, you know, when you're on the product side, if your if your metrics are usage or health outcomes, or even if you're a, a, some sort of a SaaS, they have to continue paying for it. Uh, they have to continue to see value uh, within the product. And, you know, product design is so challenging. Um, in my mind, you can do a lot and you, you have a lot of great tips around this in your book uh, on the, the sales process, because there, there might be an environment in the sales process you can control. If you have your own store, if you're um, you know, the, you're setting up the arrangement, you're controlling the environment. The hard part about product design is you're giving someone a product and putting it in their environment. Um, or if it's, if it's a product that's not a physical piece, like just a mobile app, you know, you're one mobile app out of a hundred on the phone. And that phone is one object out of thousands of objects within their house. And so it's just extremely challenging um, to really account for their environment uh, and designing for the context in which they use it. Uh, because again, their mind state when they're, you know, in, in a store might be very different than when they're at home on the couch. And, you know, you factor in whether they're tired or not, or who they're around or how their day is going. And, and there's just so much constant change within people's lives from a day-to-day -day, uh, standpoint it's hard to account for how am I going to fit into that? So um, being able to, to design around, you know, what their current behaviors are and even knowing their behaviors today might be different than their behaviors tomorrow, right? If I get a poor night's sleep or if I'm traveling, uh, the, the, the normal gym routine shifts, you know? So I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges is to just try and design around people's current behaviors when we're just all so different and the context of our day-to-day -day lives uh, can shift so much day-to-day. -day. You know, I learned something kind of really interesting that you're, when, when you're talking, it's reminding me, but you know, we're Texas boys and one of the most fierce nomadic people roamed the areas that we live in, right? And that was the Comanche. And so they could shoot arrows like crazy while they're riding and they would get those guys and put them in a stationary and have them try to shoot at a target and they, they wouldn't be accurate. Oh, but you that. could, you could put them on a horse being shot at, and then they're like dead on when you don't create this, the environment correctly, you get bad data off of your <laughs> testing. Right. Love that. I didn't know where you're going at first. Steve I was like, man, I'll, I'll let you go for a minute, but that was great. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> it's like, what is it? <laughs> no, but it's, you know, yeah. I look for I disconnected uh, yeah. uh, realms that mm -hmm. verify the theory. And yep. that just hit me there. And I was so, it made total sense to me that they don't stand still. They're actually is in motion. So if you're designing a product for in motion, but you're testing it standing still, you're yeah. way off tar target. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Exactly. That's and, great. and even, you know, what we face a lot is we have to try and design a product, you know, like say our product was to, to help people shoot more accurately. We have to try and design a product that's effective, you know, in both those scenarios. Right. So if we're yeah. trying to help people make better nutrition decisions, it's not just what are you doing when you're at home and you have the perfectly healthy meal pre-made? It's what are you doing? 
uh, the day of the Super Bowl, or what are you doing, you know, when you're out with your friends, or what are you doing at a work event? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the the constant context of our environment influences our decisions so much. So mm -hmm. to be able to create products to help people change behavior uh, is such an uphill battle uh, for that very reason. And, you know, our, our environment plays such a big factor, and we don't just live within this vacuum of isolated decision making. Uh, we live in this world. Um, you know, of constant evolving and change uh, within our environment. Yeah. yeah. So Clayton, let me ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story um, about a product design issue that I worked on one where I incorporated behavioral science principles. And I want, I want you to follow up with a story of what you have done, like a challenge you've had to overcome and where maybe behavioral science helped you. So quickly for mine was I was working with a company that manufactured mosquito control units. So basically overseas, India, Brazil, you know, mosquitoes are an, a major health issue. And so you have to try to protect your family. And so this company, you know, global company went out and they started designing these units where you could plug these units inside of a wall and needed to electro electricity. And then it would sp spit out, spritz out, you know, pesticide basically. Um, and so when they're asking customers all over the world, what do you want? Well, people are like, oh my gosh, I want to make sure that I have a variable that would control the timing of it, the mists. Great. So maybe when nobody's home, it mists more. And I want to be able to control the smell. So there's another little variable. Oh, and also want to make sure that um, it, it, I can control the amount. So not even just the time, but the amount. <clears throat> and so as, as more and more research was happening on this product design, they built out all this incredible, you know, powerful, great units, sent them out to market and they flopped flop badly. And so they brought us in to ask us kind of what do you know from a behavioral sciences perspective? And what we did was we went back to all these people and we asked them some very basic motivational you know, reasons why um, you know these units were even important in their lives. And what we found out is many of these moms, they're protecting the family. And their whole point over there, let's say in Brazil or in India, was that their number one goal is to, I don't want my family to be exposed to Zika virus or any of the other viruses out there. And so I must protect my family. And these units, every time you increase another variable, like something as simple as you know the, a nozzle spraying out or maybe time of day or all these things, it added complexity to the machine. And their fear was that if something goes down, then everything breaks and therefore I'm not protecting. So what they really wanted was a simple solution because over-engineering it actually created more fear in, in, their, in, their, uh, in their hearts. So that was an example of we told them you overdeveloped, you overdesigned, strip all these things out because people will tell you they want that. But in their home, they're like, what if one nozzle thing fails? My whole family's at risk. So that was an example of, of something I've worked on just by understanding that core motivation behind you know that unit. Is there anything similar or anything you could talk about a story you have for your product today? Yeah, I, I, you know, maybe not necessarily to the, the point of uh, the core motivation, but just tying back in exactly what you said. If you ask people what they want, um, they're going to tell you one thing, but that doesn't coincide with what they actually do. Um, and we see that so often in the product world where we've built these great things. We've built exactly what, tell, uh, what people tell us they want, and then they don't use it. They don't like it. They don't want it. They don't buy it, you know. Um, so... Uh, as an example, you know, I told you a little bit about our flagship product. We, we do want to extend beyond just having that 10, 15 second weigh in experience. Uh, so we've developed Shapa into being a more encompassing overall um, health and wellness app. Uh, we have a number of different features. Um, we give people daily missions uh, based on a lifestyle survey to help kind of nudge them towards things. Uh, but one thing we keep uh, kept getting demand for, and it's a very popular sort of thing that almost every weight loss app will have is some sort of a food locking, uh, food logging mechanism. And so the feedback uh, that I receive from talking to all of our members is, is exactly kind of what you said. I want something that I can track every single thing that I eat uh, I can input, you know, the exact calories I can type it in and it'll pull up all the data for it. Essentially tools that already exist in other apps, but they just wanted it to be integrated into our app. And so this is one of those situations where I, I already knew this from 10 years of experience in health and fitness is you, you need something that's a sustainable long-term solution. And, you know, from 10 years of, of experience working with clients, anyone trying to log everything they eat is just a setup for failure that has maybe a two to four week 
um, lifespan on it. There are some, you know, anomalies out there. I have some, some very fit friends that are highly focused on it. Uh, but that's the, you know, that's the one-offs. That's not the normal people. So, you know, from really digging deep, yeah, digging deep, talking to people, what they really seem to want is I want a way to somewhat track my progress uh, with eating and to be able to think about um, what I'm eating as I'm, I'm doing it. And so what we did is we kind of looked at, there's too many variables that we can't control for that would take you know, as you said, we're, we're a small business, we're a startup, uh, we don't have this massive engineering team. So building out an entire library of foods, one would would be a heavy burden on us. But two, I think it just wouldn't be effective or helpful for anyone that's trying to do this behavior for a long term. So what we did instead, is we looked at how can we create a, a tracking mechanism that doesn't require a lot of time, a lot of mental energy, a lot of effort, uh, doesn't restrict people to certain foods or food categories, and most importantly, doesn't make them feel bad about what they're eating because that's a, another big one with food logging. The first time you have to log something you perceive as a negative food, you know, having one slice of pizza, uh, all of a sudden my whole diet's off. So uh, what we created is what we call a mindful eating log. So rather than actually logging what you're eating uh we instead prompt you to think about how hungry you feel before each meal and we provide people uh, a scale of about 10 different options uh, anything from i'm starving i'm about to pass out to i'm so full i'm not hungry at all and so we're just triggering people to before you even eat just think about are you hungry and give people some guidance on you know this is about the range you should be eating if if, if you're beyond that range well, you might not even be hungry at all. It might not be a good time to eat. Um, and then we do the same thing after each meal. We try and prompt people to think about, well, how full do you feel? Did you eat to the point of feeling like you have to, you know, un unbutton the pants or, or did you just reach a point where you're comfortable and feel satisfied? Um, and that's one of our big challenges is not necessarily what we're eating, uh, but just, you know, over time, right? It's not even a day-to-day -day thing. It's, it's a accumulation over years um, we eat a, a, an above average amount beyond our, our caloric needs. And that's what leads to this, this weight gain over time. So um, the way we resolved it is, hey, we don't think you need to put in exactly how many ounces of salmon you had and what foods you did. And we don't even think you need to see this kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, but similar to our weigh-in experience, we give you some color feedback uh, based on what you're logging to let you know are you eating within the range? Are you uh, eating on a regular basis when you're not even hungry, which which kind of lets you know, uh, hey, I, I may just be overeating um, out of habit or out of uh, time or whatever it may be. Um, and then same thing on the fullness side, we give you a color to let you know, hey, you, you may need to slow down, eat a little bit less, stop and think about those things. So yeah, that's, that's um, you know, getting good results so far, plenty still to build on, um, but we're, we're getting some great feedback. Great example, man. Thank you. You know, Will, you were, he said it when you were talking about, they were asking the folks, you know, what they wanted that device to do. But what it boiled down to is the behavioral science comes in when you hear, they'll say this, but when you hear what they're wanting to feel, they wanted to feel that they protect their family. So that helps you. They're saying these things, but you have to apply the behavioral science to understand, translate it to what they're they're saying as far as they want to feel. And Clayton said it, I want to not feel bad about what I'm eating. So they're giving you colors yeah. that are giving you ways to feel better about your life. Yep. Very yeah, a very good observation for sure. For sure. Well, let me ask you, and we we we're gonna wind this up here a little bit, but you said something I thought that was interesting. Um, and so I'll just throw this out there. What is the role of intuition for you as it relates to product design? Because obviously you have 10 years, right? And you could use that or not use it. What is the role for intuition for you? Great question. Yeah, it's a, that is a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a balance um, because I, I do have what feels like 10 years of probably 45 to 55 hours a week of literally talking to individuals about their health and fitness and their decision making and all these things. So um, part of it is is my my intuition feels very strong in certain things, um, but I also have to 
recognize that, you know, the, the individuals that I'm speaking to aren't necessarily uh, an accurate representation of the entire population of, of who we're trying to serve. Um, you know, I'm very specialized in working with people who one can afford a personal trainer. So uh, their lifestyle uh, is, is going to be very different from, you know, the average standard American. So there, there's some some pros and cons. Um, you know, a, a lot of it is just understanding what people, you know, almost like a lie detector, people uh, people saying, well, I just need this solution. And I already just understand that doesn't work because I've seen people try, try and do that. Um, but it, it still takes a lot of work to have the balance of that intuition and background in health and fitness, and then seek to understand more about human behavior, uh, behavioral science, understand some of those heuristics and how they play a role. Um, and then try and dig deep into understanding what people are, are actually asking for, you know, like you hit it on the head with a mosquito example and me trying to understand, okay, you're saying you want to, to log every single item you, you want, but, you know, you dig deeper on why that's important. You need to keep laddering up and, and get to that kind of core reason. So, you know, it's a balance. I think it gives me some, some great instincts. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the world's constantly changing. So, uh, what was applicable five years ago is very different than now, right? And we've, we've seen that with COVID, right? You know, the, the world is very different. So you have to be able to have that balance of, of you know, developing a hypothesis based on that intuition, but still do the work to, to see how that's going to play out. So this wrestler thing, my brother was, was a wrestler. And I realized that wrestling was very advantageous when, you know, I was four years old and I could... I could beat him uh, all the time until he learned how to wrestle. Right. <laughs> Where am I going with this? I'd like to see there you. you I'd like to see you wrestle. Will, can we set up a time? It would make <laughs> me feel excited. I actually think that Clayton being a Texas boy would take it easy on me. Let me win. I really think he would because he doesn't want, he wants me to have a happier, more well-being in my life. He knows that if he wrestled <laughs> me down, that it would blow all my confidence in everything I do. So I actually yeah. would take him up on that because that's the kind of guy this, this guy, this young man is. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. I had, uh, you know, Steve, your, your experience sounds very similar to my older brother, who's about four and a half years older than me and spent most of his life about a foot to two feet taller than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and quickly, within a year or two of me picking up wrestling, um, the dynamic shifted. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, would be happy to set up a uh, exhibition match with Will. Um, actually, you know, if you're if you're near the Colony High School, I'm, I'm friends with the uh, head coach. Oh, he's calling you out now. I'm just down the road from the Colony High School. Yeah, I'm just down the road. Set up. Go to All meet right. at the alley at this intersection. Hey, Will, why am I doing this? I just, everybody's enjoying this podcast. You're on, on the, you're getting voted for most popular behavioral science. I'm just trying to grow views. It's a you little are. clickbaity, but that's all I'm doing. <laughs> that's, that's what a good producer does. Hey, last question for you. And then we're going to stop. But Clayton, what advice would you give somebody out there who knows, you know, behavioral science is important. They're doing some product design work, maybe even some service design work. What advice would you give them? Because you've had to go down this journey. It sounds like you had a passion. You were reading different books. But any advice you can give to somebody who's who's wanting to go down this path, the same path? Yeah, I think it's it's most important to try and identify where your career is going and understand what's the level of education you need to, to kind of map out to, to reflect that. Um, but at a minimum, if you're going to apply any sort of behavioral science, behavioral design, whatever it may be, you need to reach a point where you at least know that you don't know, you know, everything or reach a point that you know what you don't know. Right. And there's there's a big challenge within the, the behavioral science world um, as it's really new and emerging. There aren't a lot of, um, you know, master's programs that, that really set you up well for this. Um, a lot of people think, do I need to get a PhD? whatever. But then there's the, the opposite side of it where, you know, a product designer will read the, the book Hooked by Neer Eyal and think, I've got it down. You know, this is, this is it. I'm the expert. So trying to find the balance of seeking out information. You know, there's a number of good podcasts, including your, your own, a number of good books, including your own, uh, but seeking out information, seeking out certificate programs, if you want to build on on your education beyond the, the podcast and books, and then look for those, you know, programs that are master's level, PhD level, if you really want to transition into a, a full-time behavioral science role. Uh, but at a minimum, you know, try and understand uh, a basic array of concepts, 
uh, but more importantly, understand that you don't know it all and that you, you know, at, at times you, you just need to bring in an expert. And I'm fortunate in my role to, to have a baseline of information available to me, but then I can go kick the ideas off of Dan Ariely, who's, you know, a, a very big expert. So if you happen to find an expert like that, that's even better. Uh, but try and find that balance and understand, you know, where you can apply your knowledge and understand when do you really need to bring in an expert, a consultant, um, you know, hire someone in, uh, depending on kind of the scope of the work. Clayton Key, you've been a great guest on the Mind State Marketing Hour and, and actually have um, been true to form how to use science to connect with your clients better. Um, any last words before I roll this out, Will? Well, yeah, I was going to say, how can people get to know more about Shapa, more about you, any kind of things that you're working on you want the audience to know about? Yeah, I'd be happy to connect on LinkedIn. Um, you can you can definitely find me on LinkedIn pretty easily. Uh, and then if you're just interested in uh, behavioral science in general, applying it specifically to product design, programs, policies, whatever, uh, I'm you know working on getting uh, a sub-interest group built within Action Design Network. If you're unfamiliar with Action Design, uh, it's a great network designed to just bring together people in the field. Uh, they host kind of um, different meetups um, online and in cities, most major cities uh, within the U.S. And then I'm kind of forming one specifically focused on health and fitness. So if you're product designer, um, engineer, uh, behavioral scientist, kind of focused on that field, but would love to connect you and, and kind of get you set up there. That's Perfect. Cool. Excellent. So, uh, and if you want to connect with Will, let's not forget at the mindstategroup.com. You can set up a time. Will, what do you call this? You, you, you like you trick them into doing what? <laughs> I don't trick. <laughs> I like to do what's called a breakthrough session there, uh, Steve, where basically what we do, Steve has taught me that some of the best thing I can do is just literally look at your advertising through the lens of neuroscience and behavioral psychology. So if you schedule a meeting with me at the mindstategroup.com. You're going to see these little red buttons that say schedule time with Will. Schedule time with me. We'll take a look at some of your marketing. And I'll give you a, an unbiased, unfiltered evaluation from a purely neuro and behavioral science uh, perspective. And then maybe we can help you uh, optimize. And we have lots of different programs and services to help you optimize that marketing. So mindstategroup.com. And again, Clayton Key, VP of Business Development at Shapa Health. You can remember that. I get it back in the Shapa. That's right. Shapa, I used All to right. Be. That's right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And hey, shout out to those folks uh, chipping in Turner Troop, Lance Pate. Appreciate you too for uh, uh, yep. watching. We're going to roll out with some music here. Let me turn on the music. You guys, we love to watch uh, Will dance. And we're usually throwing these weird questions, but today we're going to let Will off. Thank you. And hey, did you know that this popular podcast? is on Buzzsprout, iHeart, Amazon Music, Stitcher, all those places. You can catch up on past episodes that we've had great guests as well. And you are missing out if you're not watching this. We're making jokes. We're doing stuff quietly. So want to get that fear of missing out going. Follow us at the YouTube channel, the Mind State channel. That's it. All right. I guess you're it. right. I've only done this almost a hundred times. <laughs> Be sure to get Will's book, Marketing the Mind States. If you haven't, you're, um, well, you're missing out. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of the Mind State Marketing Hour. Bye, Will. Bye, Clay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate yeah. you. The awkward smile.